Hey everybody, I'm really glad that you've tuned in to fill in the blanks. This episode is about how we can help our children and young people make up for the time lost learning and developing socially and emotionally while they were away from school activities and friends. Now, we recorded this episode earlier this year before schools reopened and prior to the Delta variant. And judging by the current mental health studies of adolescents, I do believe that everything we said, everything you're going to hear in today's podcast is right on track and everything rings true today, just as it did when I recorded this podcast. If it didn't, I would update it, but I listened to every word of it and it just doesn't need any updating. Now we're going to post some resources and tools to help you navigate the mental health needs of your children at fillintheblanks.com. So go there and look because I promise you, your kids took a hit by being out of school, being away from their friends, not being in the competition of not just sports, but just society, jockeying for their place on the social ladder, being around their peers. Being in isolation takes a toll, and it's not going to be success only as they get back into their lives. You'll hear Dr. Kostakis talk about how that impacts the different age groups, especially those in the first, second, and third grade, not just academically, but socially. And these are differences that can obtain for the next decade, the next two decades and beyond. We need to close these gaps. So listen as we talk about what those gaps are and how we need as parents to help them close those gaps. You'll find some tools on how to do that at drphillintheblanks.com. Thanks for listening. Well, hey, this is Dr. Phil, and you've tuned in to Fill in the Blanks, and this is going to be very special for you, I hope, because it is for me because I am talking to one of my favorite medical professionals. And listen, I was a big fan of Dr. Dimitri Christakis for a long time before I had the privilege and honor of meeting him and having him on Dr. Phil. And I'm going to tell you why. This guy really tells it like it is. He breaks it down so we understand it. And he sticks with science. There's not a political bone in his body He sticks with the science and talks about things that matter to us that have children and grandchildren that are caught up in so much of what's going on today and so much of what's not going on just with the pandemic. It's so interesting to hear him talk. And I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction here, but if I gave a proper introduction, it would be the entire podcast I swear. But he is director of the Center for Child Health, Behavior, and Development at Seattle Children's Research Institute. He's the George Atkins Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Washington, director of the Center of Child Health, Behavior, and Development at Seattle Children's Research Institute, editor-in-chief of JAMA Pediatrics, and an attending pediatrician at Seattle Children's Hospital, Graduated from Yale, University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, did his pediatric residency, followed by a Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholarship at the University of Washington, from which he earned his MPH. He's written 230 original research articles, a textbook of pediatrics, does television work as well, make television work for your children, the elephant in the living room. He was awarded the Academic Pediatric Association Research Award for Outstanding Contributions to Pediatric Research over his career. I could go on and on, but I want you to hear him, not me. So welcome, uh, doctor. Thank you so much for joining me again. It's a pleasure to be back, Dr. Phil. You're making me blush, man. (laughs) Well, you should blush. I have to tell you, do you ever sleep, for God's sakes? Well, I I didn't sleep pre-pandemic, and I don't sleep. I sleep much worse now. Let me put it to you that way. Well, I can well imagine. Listen, one of the things, I'm just going to jump right into this pandemic, and we're going to talk about more than that today, but I am so passionate about a lot of the work you're doing in the Christakis lab and part of the introduction of this gentleman is going to be rolling as we talk about the different things that he's doing. But you and I've talked before and I am very concerned about the impact of quarantine and the shutdown of schools and distance learning. 
taking a toll on our children in the here and now. I think it's a toll that we are going to be measuring for years and or decades to come. Talk about that a little bit in terms of what the research is showing you. I think that's absolutely right, Dr. Phil. And, you know, the, 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 the sad truth is that as we now have a vaccine and many of us are thinking we see the light at the end of the tunnel, which we do, although it's still a ways off, the full impact of this pandemic on children, just as you said, will be felt for years to come. They're suffering because of the stress they're exposed to from their parents. Um, and, and most immediately, as you pointed out, their lives have been upended because of their inability to go to school um, in most places. Most of us think of schooling as being essential for children's learning, which of course it is. Um, and children of all ages don't learn as well over a video as they do in person. I like to say it this way, even the best teacher, the most dynamic teacher, when you put her on Zoom, she becomes a boring television show for children. It's just not nearly as engaging as an in-person teacher could be. And the best teachers walk around the classroom. They engage each child where they are. They can tell by scanning the room which child is engaged, which child is falling behind. How do I make, how do I give one particular child special attention? Very, very difficult to do over Zoom. And then of course, for the youngest children, for those in primary school, there's really no evidence that distance learning works at all without a parent in the room, essentially homeschooling kids, which is not an option for many families um, who have to work outside of the home. And even for those who have the luxury of being at home, it's not something most of us are good at doing, especially when we have to balance our own needs and our own jobs. Well, that's exactly right. I don't care who we are. Most of us are not professional educators, and 64% of the workforce does not have a job that can easily be done from home, right. so they do have to work outside the home. And if they are at home and there are multiple children and they have other responsibilities and they're not professional educators and their relationship already exists in a way that they're not in the role of being teacher-student. And it's really hard to redefine that role where they have to become the educational taskmaster. So it's like you can take the advice from a teacher, but not from your mom or dad. So that makes it tough. Absolutely. I, I you know, my children are in their 20s and I shudder to think if I had to be their primary school teacher, particularly my son, it would not have gone well for either of us. Oh my God. I've got family members that'll read something in Cosmopolitan magazine and say, gosh, did you know this? And I say, yeah, actually I did. I've been telling you that for 30 years, but they read it in a magazine and it's a revelation, but they get it from dad, Dr. Phil, it goes in one ear and out the other. Prophets are without honor in their own land, you know, so it, right. this doesn't come the same from mom and dad. Well, there's that famous Mark Twain quote that I love that says, uh, his, his, his son said to him, when I left for college, my father was the stupidest man I ever knew. And when I came back four years later, I was amazed at how much he'd learned while I'd been away. <laughs> exactly. Now, you know, we talk about the learning aspect. And clearly, at first, a lot of the schools went to pass fail. So right. the standard was dropped and kids responded to that. So I think everyone would agree there's an educational quality deficit but beyond that, from a psychological standpoint, the thing that I'm worried about is that these kids are missing out on the social interaction, the competition, negotiating peer relationships, all of the things that only can come from interpersonal interactions. And the absence of that means that those skills are arrested and not developing. How do they then compete with those that didn't go through that arrestation when they get out into the competitive workforce? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So school is not just a place for cognitive development. It's equally importantly a place for social emotional development. And in fact, when you look at sort of long term studies of success, uh, social intelligence is typically a better, stronger predictor 
than, um, than, than education or even cognitive abilities, right? It really matters how you get along with people, how you negotiate. And for young children, they're in a developmental point in their life where they're learning that. And you can't learn that over Zoom. You can't learn it with adults. You really do learn it through play, in particular for young, with younger children. You also learn imagination through play. You learn negotiation, as you said. You learn cooperation. We're seeing the effects of that already. We've seen a rise of anxiety and depression. We've seen, tragically, uh, an increase in suicidal ideation and suicide attempts in, in young adolescents and adolescent children in this country. Um, and we're still in the midst of all of it. I don't think we've taken the full measure of the mental health toll, in part, in part because teachers are another essential set of eyes that frequently alert us that a child is having uh, particular levels of distress, whether mental and social. So you're absolutely right. There's a huge toll being taken. Um, and we're going to need to be prepared to mitigate that um, very aggressively. I'm also concerned that we're seeing a huge drop off in referrals to Child Protective Services and the Department of Child and Family Services, depending on what it's called in different states, but child welfare because teachers, administrators, staffers at school are mandated reporters. And so many of the referrals come from those mandated reporters who observe children that have bruises on them or report to their teachers, counselors, or whatever if they're being mentally, emotionally abused, sexually molested, or whatever. And those referrals are down some cities report as much as 50 or 60 percent, and we know that the abuse has not dropped off 50 or 60 percent, just the referrals for the abuse. So that means these children are being abandoned without objective outsiders to mitigate, so they're just being left. The number one tool of the abuser is isolation, and here we have an isolated situation, so these kids are left without protection. You're absolutely right. I mean, the paradox, Dr. Phil, is not just that reporting is down, but every indication is that it should be up, right? Because the biggest predictors of of child abuse and neglect are stress, substance use, um, financial detriments, homelessness. All of these things are on the rise, right? So it makes no sense that we're seeing less child abuse and neglect. We would be expecting to see more and we're seeing less. It's out there. We're just not capturing it. Well, you and I are two people I know that have been talking about this for months, all of these things for months, the social loss, the mental emotional development, the educational loss, the abuse issues. You and I, I know, are two people that have been talking about this, and we're not the only ones, but we certainly have been at the forefront of the narrative. Why is no one doing anything about this? Why is this not headline? Why, when it's talked about, everybody goes, oh, yeah, okay, how many people died today? How many cases were reported today? But yet this doesn't get a headline beside it. Well, you know, the sad truth is, as much as we talk about how important our children are, um, we vote with our feet. We vote with our pocketbook. And um, children don't vote. They don't uh, make financial contributions. And all too um, commonly, they are not the um they are not our, our, they're not our top priority. And this has been made clear over and over again. We make it clear when we have bars and restaurants open and schools closed. We have it made clear when we have two stimulus packages that had a trillion dollars each and vanishingly few dollars were directed towards schools or to services for children. Um, this, is, this is the reality and it's an unfortunate one. Um, I think it's shameful. Other countries have not done it the way we've done it. Um, Some started the way we did. I mean, I don't fault us for shutting schools down early in the pandemic. I think it was the right thing to do because we didn't know how dangerous the virus was to children. And we had every reason to believe that schools would be a major source of contagion because they usually are. The moment we we close schools, we should have been focused on how do we get kids back? and we didn't. There's going to be a very long tail to this pandemic, long in terms of eradicating the contagion and much, much longer in terms of um, 
seeing the full effects of it on children's cognitive, social, and emotional development. Well, I couldn't agree more. And make no mistake, every single life that's lost, whether it is a child, teens, 20s, 30s, 60s, 70s, every life that's lost to this disease in America is tragic. Every dollar spent to fight this disease at any level is valid. And I'm not complaining about the money and effort that's been spent where it's been spent. I'm just complaining about what money hasn't been spent to focus on the children and the education and development of them mentally, emotionally, socially, educationally, relationally. And you're right. This is a long lead question and solution. I read a poll that said less than 25% of African Americans are saying they will take the vaccine. Right. And yet we know that there are increased numbers of fatalities and severe reactions in that particular population. So in the inner cities, are we going to have low socioeconomic and minorities that are under vaccinated and over infected? And how are we going to deal with that? You can clear some of this up from the medical side. What is the truth about the vaccine? What do people need to understand? Yeah, so first of all, I want to reiterate what you said, that there is a longstanding, understandable distrust of the African-American community, uh, particularly with respect to vaccinations and experimental therapies. Uh, It goes back to Tuskegee. It goes back longer than that. I'm not a medical historian, but this this distrust is is longstanding and it's it's well-founded, at least historically. Uh, I think this vaccine is safe. You're absolutely right that the communities that that need it the most may be the least likely to take it, uh, which is very unfortunate because the other toll that, that, that this disease takes is the loss of a parent or a grandparent, which is disproportionately affecting minority uh, populations and children of color. And the state of bereavement for a child over the loss of a parent or a grandparent itself is a huge impact. So about the vaccine itself, it's about the most effective vaccine that we have. The measles is the only thing that compares to it. So it's a very effective vaccine. People need to be vaccinated for us to stop the cycle. Are we going to get there? I don't know. Now, so far, we know that uh, the vaccine is effective and it's safe in terms of side effects. And one can rightly ask, well, what about long term side effects? And I have to be honest with you. You said I'm I'm a man of science. I am. Nobody knows the long term side effects because the vaccine hasn't been around that long. Right. Um, we won't know the long-term side effects, if any, for some time. Um, but I've studied the science. I'm not a vaccinologist, um, but I'm, I'm voting with my feet. I think the problem is that we have politicized this. We've politicized the pandemic, by the way, all over the place. Um, every aspect of it has been made, has been politicized, which is extremely unfortunate. And I hope we, we can undo that with respect to the vaccine because it's the, the virus isn't a it does, the virus doesn't belong to a political party and the vaccine shouldn't belong, belong to a political party either. Well, let me ask you this. Some people are afraid of the flu vaccine because they think that it gives them the flu because they think they're getting a live piece of virus, which is not the case. But with this vaccination, I have read accounts that say when you get the first one, you're going to have some soreness at the injection site, and you may feel a little rough that day. When you get the second one three weeks later, I've read articles that have said I had the worst fever of my life. I had chills. I had shortness of breath. It was like I had a day of COVID-19, and it was terrible but it went away in 24 hours. What percentage of the people are having that degree of side effect, if you know? Once you start breaking it down by age, by gender, um, by race, by ethnicity, by underlying disease, by past exposures to other viruses, you end up with very, very small um, cell sizes to figure out the exact side effects. But what you said in principle is exactly right. The first vaccine causes a local reaction uh, just from the needle itself. 
um, some mild inflammation at the injection site. And then with the second vaccine, um, some people do have some of the symptoms of COVID. Now, why is that? What does the vaccine do? Well, the vaccine is in effect activating your immune system, right? It's, it's, it's giving it the signal it needs to look for COVID the next time it sees it. So the second time you get the vaccine, you're getting in effect some of the um, COVID spike protein that your immune system is looking for. And so you're having some of that um, immune reaction. People have to realize that the symptoms of a virus, many of them, are your body's own immune system fighting that virus. Right. right? We, most people don't understand that. They think the virus is causing the symptoms. Actually, most of the symptoms are your own body fighting the virus. So you will, people will have that reaction. But what I can say categorically and assuredly is that those that the effects of the vaccine are way less than one would have if they actually got symptomatic COVID. Now, not everyone gets symptomatic COVID, but if they had symptomatic COVID. And keep in mind, we're now seeing a sizable percentage of people become what we call long haulers and have prolonged symptoms of the virus going on eight, nine, 10 months. None of that has been seen with the vaccine itself. So you're way better off having the symptoms you get from the vaccine than from getting COVID itself. Is it your belief that we should have in school, brick and mortar, classroom, attendance? So it's hard to make a blanket recommendation about that for the entire country and for all children. What I would suggest is that we um, start with some basic principles. One, that getting children to school should be our first priority. So that's one principle. Um, the second principle is that, that um, we need to have systems in place to try to keep schools as safe as possible. We know the things that need to happen. It varies tremendously how well schools are able to do those things. So teachers need to have medical grade PPE. Classrooms need to have opportunities for children to, to, to wash their hands for hand hygiene. Children need to wear masks. They need to be trained to wear masks and they need to wear them reliably at, as early as they're developmentally capable of doing it. And then we need to, as best as possible, in an age appropriate way, practice social distancing. These things work. We know they've worked in the community and they've worked in some schools that have managed to go back. So I, I think that we should prioritize getting children back in school. We should focus first on primary school children because they're the ones that are hardest hit from this, that are getting virtually no education without parental involvement. And all of us as a community should make that our number one priority. Now, I, I fully recognize that one of the drivers of keeping bars and restaurants and other businesses open is the necessity to, to maintain those businesses. But there are other ways of doing that um, that we should have done from the beginning. Many countries in Europe, for example, guaranteed people their paychecks, but told them to stay home, except for essential businesses. And I would argue that bars and restaurants are not essential businesses. Um, all in all as a means to helping children get uh, be in school. So the answer to your question is, and I'm not, I don't mean to dodge it. I, I just think that there shouldn't be a community in the United States where bars and restaurants are open and schools are not. That should be the litmus test. If everything in the community is closed, if the prevalence is so high, if the spread is so rampant, then shut everything down. But let's put children first. And you're also saying it's not one size fits all. You have some areas where population density is so much less than others, where contagion might be at a much less rapid rate, where it's a reasonable risk to open a school where it might not be in, say, a New York City or a San Francisco or something where you have much greater density and opportunity for contagion. And yet, and yet New York City schools are open and schools that have... Uh, so uh, you, uh, here's a tale of two cities. New York City schools are open. They they, they closed temporarily, they've reopened them. And the prevalence in New York, as best we can estimate prevalence, is almost twice what it is in Seattle. And Seattle schools have been closed the whole time. So, right. you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting decision that's made locally. And, um, and I also wanna point out that these, and I, and I know it's frustrating for parents because many parents hear these positivity rates that are thrown out. 
And different school districts, different cities, different communities have different positivity numbers. Um, they're all made up. Nobody knows what the right answer is. And in fact, school districts that have opened under different levels have seen different amounts of spread because of all the reasons we've talked about, how well the school is actually doing mitigation strategies. So everyone's in search of that number that tells you you can open schools safely or not, but there is no such number. There really isn't. There was an article, estimation of U.S. children's educational attainment and years of life lost associated with primary school closure during the coronavirus pandemic. That's, that's my article. No, no, that's okay. why I'm referencing it. <laughs> okay. Can you explain what you were talking about there? Because you say that 5.53 million years of life lost because of the primary school closures. Right. So the, the study is based on sort of what, two widely uh, accepted assumptions. One, that um, education improves health, that the more educated children are, the healthier they will be over their lifetimes. And the second is that interrupted schooling, uh, distance learning, as we're calling it, um, doesn't really work well, if at all, for primary school kids. So if we accept those two premises, then the question becomes, okay, distance learning doesn't really work, so we're impacting children's educational attainment, and that educational attainment has implications for um, their life expectancy. So if you look in the United States alone, okay, um, education is a very strong predictor of lifelong health for many reasons, because better education means better job. In our country, better job means better health benefits. <laughs> um, right. It means longer vacations for relaxation. Um, it means all kinds of things that improve health and longevity. So what we did in that study was try to model what the consequence will be of children missing education and therefore having lower educational attainment on their expected life expectancy many years in the future. So this isn't kids dying today. This is them dying, living shorter lives ultimately. And again, it's one of the invisible aspects of this pandemic. We're not gonna see those effects now. We're gonna see them later. We're gonna see drops in high school graduation uh, the moment kids go back to school, but we're gonna keep seeing high school graduation rates go down um, for many years to come, unless we take aggressive remediation um, uh, approaches. And that's another essential part of this, Dr. Phil, that you know, when September comes, if we think the pandemic is over, it's not over for children, and we need to invest resources to help make them whole. There always have been disparities in children's education in our country. Those disparities are being exacerbated enormously. You mentioned before about some parents not even being able to work from home, not being comfortable teaching their children. There are many parents who have a lot of income who have basically hired teachers to provide private tutoring to their right. children. Those kids are still suffering the social emotional damage from not being in school, but they're getting a very good education. Right. Not true of their low income classmates. Right. I know some people that have hired teachers that are getting three or four families' children together. Exactly. And they're doing private classes and they're probably getting more attention than they would get in a 20 person classroom. That's great, but that's a privilege most don't get. That's correct. And that's going to be one of the enormous challenges teachers face in the fall when, if and when they are reunited with their students. They're going to find that it's not as if all students are six or nine months behind and we can just wind back the clock and start where we would have been six or nine months ago. They're going to be at very different stages. Some kids might even be ahead of where they otherwise would have been. Add to that that there's going to be wide variation in children's mental health and social distress, which is going to require even more private uh, attention and resource. Schools are going to need an enormous influx of cash to deal with all of these things. And again, it's something we should be planning for now. We know it's going to happen in the fall, right? No surprise there. No one is going to be shocked to see that there's going to be kids that are behind, kids that are under a lot of emotional distress, kids that are depressed, anxious. Um, we know all that. So 
where is the plan to start hiring additional teachers' aides, social workers, mental health workers to be in the schools to deal with this crisis? We can't start that in August and be ready in September. Um, We need to start planning now for it. Well, that's right. And I know this statistic, and I've heard you talk about it as well, and that is graduation rates are going to decline. And the reason for that, or at least one reason for that, in my opinion, is that if children are not reading on grade level in the third grade, the prediction is that their likelihood of not graduating is four times normal. Correct. And in lower socioeconomic, it's six times normal. And the whole point is that when they get back into school and they are behind, they just never catch up. And so they become more and more discouraged. Their self-esteem goes down. Their self-worth goes down. Their motivation goes down. So they begin to look for other ways to find self-worth and self-esteem, compensation in other ways. So they become less motivated academically. And with the frustration, they just turn away from their education. That's what I fear is these kids are going to go back with this six, nine, 12 month deficit, be frustrated by the inability to do work, particularly if they're at that cusp where they go from fourth to fifth grade, where things really pick up and they're expected to do more independently that the gap is going to be so great that they just don't ever close the gap. And that's where you see them start falling behind. You're absolutely right. So the first assessment we got, the first kind of what we thought was a national assessment of children's performance in the fall showed that, um, that reading hadn't suffered very much, but math in particular had suffered 10 to 12 points. But here's the missing part of all that. The missing part is the missing part. There were 25% of the US children that we had no assessment on at all. And those are the ones I worry about the most, right? These are the kids that no one could even find to do the assessment on. These are probably the kids that aren't even doing distance learning. Who knows what's happening to them? No one's done an assessment on them. So those are the kids that are gonna be even most impacted and we have no idea just how profound their deficits are gonna be until we do those assessments when we see them again in the fall. And you're right. The, the, the biggest tragedy with our education system is that very early performance is highly predictive of long-term graduation rates. Again, it's the reason primary school is so important. Kids get on trajectories very early in life. And if they start to fall behind, school, as you said, they get discouraged, school becomes a challenge. It's not, it's not engaging, it's not fun, it's distressing, and that creates kind of a vicious uh, downward spiral. Yeah. And then you've got the problem with iatrogenic labeling. They label themselves, the system labels them. Then they start living to the label and you get a snowball effect. And this is what's going to be so profoundly impactful in years to come that is invisible right now. And one thing I know for sure, and I testified before a bipartisan committee on the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act about putting funding in to deal with cyberbullying. And one thing I know for damn sure is if you don't put money in the budget to put it in the curriculum, heightened awareness, doing a workshop at the beginning, you might as well be spitting in the ocean. If you don't put money in the curriculum, if you don't put time in the curriculum, If you don't put accountability in the curriculum, it won't get done. And if we don't do something to close this gap and put in mechanisms in the curriculum to grab these kids that have fallen back and close that gap, it'll never get closed. It has to be an affirmative program where they are identified, their level is determined, and that's remediated and remediated right up front. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. You know, the truth of the matter is that schools were cash strapped before the pandemic. It's not like they were very well equipped to meet most children where they were, particularly low income children before all of this. So there's no reason to expect they're going to be in a better position afterwards. Moreover, keep in mind that a lot of schools budget comes from local tax levies. Right. And most places are seeing a huge cuts in those. So the truth is that 
Schools under normal circumstances will have even less resource to deal with many greater challenges. And so you're absolutely right. We should be thinking strategically now about what mechanisms need to be put in place and providing the resource for it now, today, tomorrow. And no one's talking about it. Yeah, you and I need to be making a visit to Capitol Hill and speaking to these committees about putting money in the budget for this because they're cutting programs, not adding and all of these stimulus programs, that may be great, and they need that, but they need it for the schools as well. These teachers, the vast majority of these teachers are getting paid embarrassingly low and still getting in their own pockets for materials to use in the classroom. And now they're going to be asked to do this as well. I'm ready whenever you are, Dr. Phil. If you want to go to Capitol Hill, I'll come with you. I'd be delighted. I'll tell you what, I'm going to take you up on that because I can make it happen and I'm going to make it happen because they right. need to focus on this. They absolutely do. I think it's so, so very important. And I guess my next question, since I've got the expert of experts here, is what do you say to parents to do now to help manage this scenario? Because as we say, we've got parents that aren't educators. They you know, have 2.2 kids, a barking dog, a double income family. So they're both working outside the home, hopefully. They both have been able to keep some form of income flowing in. There is depression, stress, anxiety, worry about mortgage and things of that nature. Is there something they can do to minimize the gap, maximize the learning experience? Is there some formula, some piece of advice we can give to these parents to help them navigate this terrain? So the first thing parents need to do is to give themselves grace. It's an extraordinarily stressful time. And, um, and all parents are uh, not only dealing with their own stressors, but the stressors of their children. And, and they are worried. I get, I get emails and calls from parents all over the country severely anxious about the impact on their children's mental health and on their, on their cognitive development. Um, we're all doing the best we can, and that's what's most important. In terms of practical advice, um, primary school kids may not find their Zoom talk with their teacher engaging at all. Don't worry about that. Don't try to force them to do it. They're not gonna get anything out of it, especially if they're not interested. Better that you watch the content if you can and get some sense of how you can use those uh, lesson plans in reaching your own child. Uh, middle and high school kids can, to varying degrees, uh, participate in distance learning, but again, Every child is different and every family is different in terms of the resources they have, both, both in terms of social resources to support their children, but just also in terms of the technology and the bandwidth to allow them to even zoom in. Again, do the best you can and give yourself grace. There's, there's Many of these things are beyond our control and you can only control the things you can control. The final thing I would say though, around children's mental health in particular, and this, you know, frankly varies with what a lot of public health um, advice publicly given is. And that is to identify a pod for your child or for your family so that you can have contact with people outside of your family. And particularly that your children can have opportunities to play and interact with kids their age outside of the family. Zoom play dates just don't work for, for primary school kids, for toddlers. They need to be around other children and we need to create opportunities for them to do so. So find another family or two that shares your values, that are very careful about their own um, uh, mitigation strategies, that would alert you if they were ever exposed to anybody that was sick, that doesn't socialize with other people outside of the pod that you've created, and try to find opportunities for you guys to get together. Ideally outside, if possible, for the kids to play, if you live in a place where the weather allows it, um, but inside if necessary, masked if possible. So I think this is something that we really need to be doing. Many people are doing it, but the problem is because without sort of very discreet advice, people are doing it willy nilly. You know, this is the big concern I have, Dr. Phil, this pandemic fatigue has set in the, the fatigue makes people do things that they shouldn't do. We need to do this safely and in a, in a um, 
you know, in as protective a way as we can. And I can tell you that not only have I created, my family's created a pod, most of my colleagues have. We don't talk about it publicly, you know, there's no public health official saying do it this way. But I think especially for young children is something that we need to do. Well, what great advice. And I want to go back to one of the things you said early on, because it needs underlining. You said these primary school kids are probably getting little or more likely nothing out of these Zoom learning sessions because it's just two-dimensional and they just can't relate. But you said for the parents, if they at all possible can watch or review the lesson and then go over that with their kids so it is human contact and they can do it. And I've got two grandchildren Avery 10 and London eight and a half. And my son Jay and daughter in law Erica do exactly that. And I have two very precocious grandkids, so they are really good at school. But their parents sit down with them and interact with them about it. And they turn it into games like flashcard, long division sort of things. And they do it while they're shooting baskets outside or something and work their way through it. And it just comes alive for them. So even if you can just take 30 minutes or 45 minutes and do what you're saying, it brings it alive for them and jumps off the screen where it's human interaction. And I've not heard anybody say it that way. That is such a brilliant point. And you don't need to take three hours to do it. You can do it in 45 minutes or 30 minutes and go over it and bring it alive for them. That is such a good advice. And you're right about this pod thing, and nobody wants to talk about it. But the fact is, if you're responsible, I don't know anybody that's not doing that. It's better than just haphazardly going off. If you know people that they're maintaining CDC guidelines, you know who they're around, you know that they're respecting all of the guidelines with wearing the mask and washing their hands and staying out of crowds. You know who they've been around. So it's safe to let your kids be with those kids. What they gain from that interaction and that play, to me, it's certainly worth the risk if you do it responsibly and particularly if you can do it, like you said, outside or in a well-circulated area with good circulation. It just seems to make all the sense in the world. The truth is, 10 months into this with quarantine fatigue, the realities are what they are. Exactly. I've got friends that come over and play tennis at my house, and I know there have been friends for 20 years. They go from their house to my house to play tennis and back to their house and my house to play tennis and back to the, and they work from home and, and that's right. it. And we're outside and, you know, we're spread out and it works fine. Yes, absolutely. Probably your tennis game's improving as a result of all this. Oh, everybody's tennis game's improving because <laughs> <laughs> you get to play every day because nobody's one, going into work. There's one good thing that's come with the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there are ways to do this, and I feel so badly for people that are in a city, in a high-rise where it's hard to get to a green belt and get outside and stuff, or in the north where the weather is tough, and it just makes it harder and harder, which is why I really hope that this vaccine takes hold and has the effect that we want it to have. Do you think there will be a vaccine for children or do you think that's something that's necessary? I think there will be a vaccine for children eventually. Um, I'll tell you that I think we need to take the very long view of the vaccine for children because the vaccine safety profile needs to be much better for children. Think about where we used to be with, with something like chicken pox, right? When I was a kid, we used to have chicken pox parties because right. the worst thing was to get chicken pox as an adult. If you got it as a child, I mean, it, I won't lie to you, it wasn't the best week of my life, but I, but I got chicken pox. In fact, yeah. My mother put my brother and me in a car, drove around with our neighbor when their child got chicken pox, and lo and behold, we both got it a week later. Um, chicken pox, is, I'm using it as an analogy because it's much more severe in adults than it is in kids. 
And we do have a chickenpox vaccine now, which is required in many places. Um, took many years to develop. And it took a long term, long term studies to show that, in fact, it really is safe and good for kids because we wanted to be sure that it wasn't worse than the original disease was for kids. Right. Um, fewer than 100 kids a year died from chicken pox back in the day. So we really need to make sure the vaccine is safe. And a lot of people and I want to point this out to you because a lot of people, including a lot of scientists, have said to me, well, I mean, if the vaccine works in older children and adults, why won't it work in children? Well, this virus is not like any virus we've ever seen before. It doesn't work the way viruses normally do. Normally, young children are much more susceptible to viruses than older children or adults are. Um, so this virus is very different in children. It's very possible the vaccine will be very different in young children. The clinical trials now go down to age 12 that have just started. I think they're uh, both Moderna and Pfizer, from what I understand, do have plans to go younger than that. Um, but that's going to take time. And the truth is, the truth is, from a societal perspective, Dr. Phil, if we vaccinated everybody over the age of 12, right, we could open up and we could get back to normal um, and we can wait to make absolutely certain that our youngest children will be safe from this vaccine before we give it to them. Clearly, there will be a new normal. You know, there's a sizable percentage of people that are not interested or not willing or at least scared or hesitant to take the vaccine. So if we can move that needle, we will be uh, close to back to normal. You know, I think it's going to take a long time for all of us to feel comfortable not wearing a mask. We're going to have to unlearn that bit of muscle memory. You know, I I don't know if you've had this experience. I well, I watch a lot more movies and shows than I ever have during this pandemic. And I, right. I kind of have this aversive reaction when I see people up close not wearing a mask. You know, it's like, right. well, what are you doing? You know, when was this filmed? Um, that That's how inculcated it's become right into our psyche. So you're the psychologist. This doesn't, we don't just un unlearn that one day, right? It's going to take a while to get beyond that aversive reaction to not having a mask on. And I wonder if the new normal is going to be that we don't shake hands, that we do yes. an elbow bump, or we just kind of uh, nod if some of the things that we've done for so many generations are going to become obsolete and we're going to do things differently. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting you say that because, you know, the teachers in primary and secondary school that say to themselves, I get sick every year. I get influenza. I get every cold, everything. Um, first of all, it's not entirely clear they got it in the school. They might have gotten it in the community. But even those that got it in the school, we know they're not actually doing a lot of the things they should be doing. And maybe that will be the new normal. Not necessarily yes. wearing masks in school, but being more conscious of washing our hands not touching other people's uh, faces, wiping surfaces. I bet we're going to see much less influenza transmission in the years to come in schools. Yeah, I think so. Because teachers have always thought they're, I've heard them describe them, I'm in here with 30 little Petri dishes, so I've got to take care of myself. And now they're actually doing it. So there is some silver lining to this. We'll be more cognizant of it. I wonder if we are reducing our natural immunity by not being exposed to some of the germs that we've built up an immunity to by being so clean. Is that a possibility? It's an interesting point. Um, and we've seen it. We've seen it in my hospital. Admissions for all infectious diseases are way down because, because social isolation doesn't just work for COVID. It works for all viruses. Right. Um, so we've seen a, a drop in admissions for asthma, for what we call uh, bronchiolitis, which is a, uh, a pneumonia that young children get, which is an infectious disease. Um, and uh, what that means is that young children in particular that usually get these viruses and build up immunity are not getting them um, this year. So what that means is that, and we'll see whether or not this is true, that they will be more susceptible to them when they are back in school. They're not building up an immunity. Most parents know this, that if your child is in daycare, I went through this. They have a cold, it seems like continuously, because it's right. typically the, the typical cold symptoms will last four to six weeks in a kid, and they usually get one every other month. So the feeling is that their child has a runny nose all the time. Yeah. But those vi but their frequency of viral infections actually goes down. And the more infections they get uh, early in life, the fewer they get at school age. 
So children that are uh, kept by nannies in their home, when they first start school, they get a lot more infections than children that were in daycare because they have not built up the immunity you talked about. So yes, we are creating a cohort of young children in particular that have seen very, very few uh, viruses. Yeah. It, it only means that their parents are gonna be dealing with more sick days than they have in the past, but it'll yeah, still be much so. better than being on lockdown. I think what we're saying is that parents definitely should show themselves some grace if they're feeling stress, pressure, and tension about this because they didn't sign up to be workers, parents, and teachers in isolation. Cut yourself a break because it's natural that this seems to be overwhelming your coping energies. That doesn't mean you're a bad parent. It doesn't mean that you're weak. It just means that this is a perfect storm of demands and show yourself some grace. And, and share that, grace with others. Right. Everybody needs it. Exactly. And that they should definitely be leaning into getting their children back to school because it is in their child's best interest, cognitively, educationally, socially, emotionally, relationally, competitively, just across the board developmentally, they're better off to be interacting so they can close the gap developmentally with all of these skills that can only come through interpersonal interactions. Absolutely. I agree. And is there some risk to that? Yes, but I think it's greatly outweighed by all the gains you get from having those interactions and will pay off in the long term. And neither you nor I are saying to be reckless about this or to put teachers' lives at risk and throw caution to the wind for them. In fact, both of us are saying they should go to the front of the line with other essential workers because our children are essential. And they spend 40% of their waking hours with teachers. They're shaping our children's young minds and they're tremendous assets to our society. So we should protect our teachers and put them at the front of the line. But I certainly recommend that we get the schools open as soon as we can safely do it with a plan, protect our teachers, but get our kids back into the world so they can start developing the way they need to. I agree. Hopefully we can do that. And I'm not joking about us going and talking to the people that control the purse strings and the curriculum for the schools on a federal basis, because as you say, they've been cutting programs and budgets, not adding to it. And this is going to be a big one. And I agree. Uh, you and I are I, like minded on this. I wasn't joking when I said I would join. You know, <laughs> so. I know you weren't. And you approaching it from the medical side and me from the psychological side, I think we could get their attention. All right, let's do it. All right, I'll see if I can't make that happen. Listen, I can't tell you what an honor it has been to have you sit down and spend this time with me. I think this is going to be so valuable for parents and grandparents alike. And I have such tremendous respect for your work and your knowledge. And I hope we can do this again as things evolve. We can be a go-to place for parents and grandparents to know what's happening in the real world. My, my, my pleasure. I'm happy to come back. And I want to thank you for covering this and for your advocacy on, on behalf of young children. They, 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 they don't have enough advocates and they really need them. And you're a very powerful one. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. We'll talk again soon, doctor. I appreciate it. All right. It. You take care. Stay safe and keep your tennis going. Oh, yeah. You can bet on that. Take care. So long. Bye.